Hi there, I'm Nathan Roach, the marketing director here at Accelerant, and I'm here with Manuela Meyer, the chief technology officer of Kokomore, a digital agency spread across Germany, Switzerland, and Spain with over 180 employees and impressive work done with big name clients like Procter & Gamble, Nestle, and original Wagner Pizza by Nestle. Uh, like, can you imagine how many frozen pizzas were probably consumed during the pandemic? <laughs> probably yeah. quite a bit. Huh? Uh, Ella quite started lot, yeah. with Kokomore back in 2003, and she's helped them grow to where they are today. And I'm super excited to get to know her and about her, her career journey. So Ella, why don't you tell us a little bit about, um, about where, where you're from, where you grew up and, and where you are now? Yeah, yeah. First, hi, and, and I'm really happy to, to be here and then nice that you asked me to join. I'm, I'm quite excited, but I'm also looking forward to it. And yeah, um, so I, I grew up in a, in a small village in the center of Germany. It's, it's called Filmar. It's near Limburg. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm coming from this area. And directly after school, I, I did an apprenticeship. So I didn't start studying directly, but I, I did this apprenticeship and it was called yeah kind of media design but back then it was already i think it was like the first step to going digital so the the people who did this apprenticeship before me still did things really with a lot of manual things and everything was analog and and we were like finally starting to do to build pages um page makeup was around then i don't know if you know this but <laughs> that was like <laughs> even before all the the layout programs you have now and um, so I, I did this apprenticeship for three years, and um, that was when I got into contact with, with computers because I never, I never was a tech person. So um, I never was interested in these kind of things. And my brother, he's the total opposite. He's younger than me, but he started to code already when he was nine or ten. So he's this typical wow. IT nerd, right? So <laughs> really, and that was early. So what did you want to do in school? Were you what were you studying at the time before your apprenticeship? I, I always wanted to go more in like a creative direction. So yeah, I wanted to go maybe to an agency, but but more on the creative side. And then I, I liked drawing, I liked painting. I, I still, it's really something I like to do in my free time to do something with my hands and to be yeah creative more or less. Um, but yeah, that was the idea. And then I ended up there and it was okay. <laughs> it wasn't the best time, to be honest. So I, I didn't like it too much there, but still I had to, to go through these three years. And then afterwards, when it was about studying, I, yeah, I had to make this decision. What, what do I want to study? And to be honest, I was too lazy to care about uh, creative studies because you, read, <laughs> you need to prepare a lot of things. Yeah. You need to prepare designs and, and paintings right, and your, everything. Your whole to portfolio. Show. Yeah, yeah, right, right. That's the word I'm, I'm lacking. Um, yeah, and I, I was too lazy for this. And then there was this, this study that was called um, Media Informatics. And I thought, yeah, that's probably quite creative. And that's probably just a bit of computers and tech. So <laughs> that's fine. Let's do this. And it was the total opposite. So the, the majority of it was about um, programming and informatics. And we had physics and all these things around. And really just a small part was about being creative and and doing some design things. Um, but yeah, still, I liked Did it. You like it. Did you like it, though? Yeah. Because... Be because <laughs> this was the first time you had worked with technology, right? Yeah, yeah, right. But but yeah, I, I liked it somehow. I mean, also back in school, I liked mathematics, so it was somehow related, and I got into it quite well. And I think it was also a big advantage that I had really great colleagues during studying, and we had a lot of fun there. So every time when somebody felt like, oh, maybe that's too much and too hard, I skipped the others, were able to lift you up, so you you stayed there, and. Yeah, I, I learned to like this. It was nothing I would have expected. So I think if you had asked me during school, if somebody had told me you will end up being a programmer, I would have given this person everything I owned because I said, okay, I'm sure this will never happen in my life because I'm not interested at all. And so I somehow slid into this. And um, then during studying, I actually started working at Kokomoro. And that was also some coincidence that... My brother knew this the former IT boss at Kokomore, and then he was asking my brother if he would like to join there as a working student, but my brother didn't want to, but he told me, yeah, well, just go and ask him and maybe maybe it fits. 
So I called this guy and what's also funny now when I'm in the position that I'm having a lot of interviews and the whole interview processes are usually rather long and you talk a lot and then many people talk with you and even for students you have interview processes. And back then it was just like, do you know PHP? So yes. Okay, you're okay, hired. Then come and start. <laughs> Um, and I remembered when I when I went there that because during study studying we mostly did Java and some Python, but PHP was only a, a minor part. And and I really read my PHP scripts <laughs> the day before before I went there because I was really scared to to get there and that people realized that maybe my PHP is not that good. And this was what like seventeen seventeen years ago or. Or longer. I mean, this was quite yeah. some time ago when you first started yes, with Tokamo, right? I think, yeah, it's something like that. So I'm now officially their employee. So after studying since 16 years, but I think I started two years before then, while be yeah, while still being a student, that I went there once once per week or twice per week to 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 work there as a working student. How many people worked with you? How 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 big was the agency when you started? <laughs> really, really small. So it was like. Totally different. I think there were like 10 people who have been really hired and then there were some students around and some freelancers, but it was really a total different world. I remember the first Christmas party we had and it was at our C CEO's home. So it was in his living room with his family and everybody fit in there and it was really small and cozy and familiar. And, and yeah, it, it happened a lot in, in these years. <laughs> Oh my gosh. And, and it's just an amazing journey from going from a, a software developer to the chief technology officer. Now Kokomore is across uh, three different countries with clients that are, these are household names. Um, yeah. Can you, can you tell us about that journey going from, you know, being a web developer, sitting in your CEO's living room with a handful of people to being the top decision maker when it comes to technology at this agency? Can you tell us about that journey? Yeah, it, it's, it was, it was a, a crazy journey in the end. So sometimes I also think back about some situations we had in the past when I've been there as a student also how different the, the whole working environment was then, right? So as a developer, you didn't have any repositories. So everybody was just coding and then you submitted something per FTP and there were no, um, yeah, there was nothing in place of, of what we are having now. And um, yeah, it, it was good to, to see to see everything grow. So we got more and more IT people in the beginning. We've just been three people. So there were, my boss, there was another colleague and I as an intern, and that was it. There also was no distinction between backend and front end or the sysadmins, or you just had the IT people and the IT people that did everything. And um, then you could you could see it grow. We got more and more people, the projects got bigger, bigger. IT always got more important. And then I think it was really lucky that I had the the right bosses at some time so that they have seen um, the direction I could take because I, I never was really outgoing and I would consider still myself as rather introvert. So there were more people around me that were louder and that were telling more that what they were doing, but still there was somebody who, who recognized that I think I was a good programmer, but it, it never was like also some people, they, they have this as a hobby, right? And that never was my case. I think I did a good job there and I liked what I did. But I think um, Marcus, what's the name of my former boss, he recognized that I also have some some other um, values and that I'm good maybe in this position in the middle to find out what um, what we really should do to, to do some requirements engineering, to also talk with the clients and then to, to be this person that's somehow connecting um, development and management and sales and, and everything like that. And that slowly grew. So in the beginning, I just did more or less than everything and in parallel, but then soon... I came at a at a point where I realized, okay, the only time I'm coding is in the afternoon or in the evenings, better like that, right? Because you're spending the whole day in meetings and running around and then trying to to enable others to work, and um, and then then I had to make this decision in the end, and it wasn't such an easy one to to decide that I stopped coding, because I realized that doing everything in parallel really won't work out. And that's already quite some years ago. So if you think in, in Drupal, I think the last Drupal project where I actively coded was with Drupal 6. And um, 
So I did some more coding in Drupal 7, but that's it then in the end. And then, then I, I took over more responsibilities. I was more like... Um, solution architect and the scrum master and then always joining in, in such a role in, in the project. So your managers, they saw this, um, uh, they saw this uh, talent that you had working with people and, and managing. So it must have felt like such a track switch away from coding to now dealing with people. Did you take like a project manager route first out of being a software developer? It was not really project manager that was rather we, we struggled a lot to be honest to find the right name for me so i really i remember that i had several meetings with my former bosses to find something how i could be labeled because it was not really clear so everybody saw what i'm doing brings value well, we and call her. yeah but it's not like okay what is it so in the end we felt most comfortable with solution architect because it was like having this this high level technical view on things but yeah, it, it was some something like that. I mean, in some projects, I did some project management, and we've always also been. I think that's something what's what's good at Kokomore that we are rather pragmatic. So as long as it fits, it's not that important that you don't know exactly <laughs> how you should put right. it. Yeah. Right. Do Do you miss coding? Um. Sometimes, mostly because I always think that it's it's um. Let me search for the word. It's it's easier to handle code than handling pe handling people, right? So yeah, if you have a problem with code, you know, then yeah, you're getting annoyed about yourself or about the code, but it's rather specific. But then if you have to deal with people, sometimes you're really stressed out and annoyed right. because somebody's getting on your nerves. And then sometimes you think, oh, I wish I could just take this code and sit there and then spend my day locked in a room and just do some coding. But in general, right. general, I'm, I'm more happy with what I'm doing now. So it's it's fine overall. Great. And, yeah. and, and your your journey there has lasted, what is it? Is it 17 years from when you were first hired as um, as an intern through to now? Is that span correct? About about 20 years? Yeah, 17, 18 years now. Yeah. And you must have learned so much about how an agency grows and <laughs> the reorganization of Kokomore along with your own career growth. Could you could you tell us a little bit about the evolution of Kokomore from that living room get together during Christmas that you mentioned <laughs> to now being yeah. what 200 people across three countries. What, what, what yeah. was watching that like or being part of it, I should say. Yeah, that was always exciting. Sometimes it was also overwhelming. So there have always been steps that have been a bit hard. So because especially in the beginning, you really knew everybody, right? And when we went for lunch, the whole agency went together for lunch and, and we had a lot of, events or not events but parties in the evening where we went out for for having some drinks and everybody knew everybody and then doing the step when suddenly you don't know everybody anymore that was also sometimes really hard because you needed to get used to it but it was also really exciting because yeah there were so many new departments that came up and then you know also only in technology you have this back end with front end devops qa all these are things that never have been there before and of course it was not always easy to grow them but that's probably also one of the reasons why i'm why i'm still there because it, it never felt like always doing the same thing but you experience so many things that happened and i mean the creative divisions we had one to creative people when we started and now you have UX design, you have visual design, you have copy, you have you have so many different areas and, and so many specialists and it's really exciting to, to work with all of these people. And for me personally, what also really is was important and a big step was when we built the office in, in Spain. So we have this office in Sevilla and it's it's nearly 10 years. So in October, in fact, it's, it's 10 years that we started with this office. And, um, and I, I'm, I'm super yeah. excited to tell you, I have to interject, I'm actually moving with my family to Sevilla in August of this oh, year. Oh, really? So, yeah, I am. Oh my I'm, God. I'm, I'm really excited. Accelerant has been very supportive. I've been working globally now for going on six years, but that'll be the next step. So um, I'm oh, looking forward great. to um, to visiting the office down there. Um, yeah, you, definitely. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing about how that got started because that was your project, right? I was reading an article that was written about you and, and you really helped to kick off 
or you led the uh, the kickoff of that office. Can you tell us a bit uh, about that? Yeah, I, I, I didn't lead the, the kickoff. I wouldn't say that, but I think I kept an important role that, that it really grew and, and worked like that. So the kickoff was something that, that our CEO came up with in the end. But first, I really envy you for, for moving to Sevilla because really I, I love the city so much. I love the people there so much. And my husband and I really thought about this for quite some time, but he's working as a biologist. And so it's not that easy like we who can work, work remotely, right? So for him, it wouldn't be possible. But still, we right. think when we are retired, we will move to Sevilla. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I'd imagine it's difficult to pack up an entire laboratory or whatever it is he does, even research and just you know yeah. move to a different country. For us, it is much easier to just pick up and go. But um, yeah. but tell me about the the office there. Um, you know how it got started and what your role, yeah. um, what your role was to get that kicked off. Yeah. So um, the, our CEO started this, and and he just has a really good friend there um, with with his own company, and this is somehow how we how it started. They we, we looked about opportunities where we could find more people because finding tech talent is always an issue, right? And it's not that easy to find good people around. And then they, they had the idea that maybe we, we have better chances to find good people in Spain. And then we really, what was really important for us was that it's not just a location, but it, it's somehow disconnected. But we always wanted to integrate the people on our team. So especially in the beginning, when we grew the team there, the people came to Germany for two or three months, most of them. So so all of the first time Spanish Kokomor people have been in Frankfurt for several months and, and really to know Kokomore, to know our um, history, to know how we work together and our ways of working, because that was really important. We, we didn't want that to be just a subsidiary and we just throw stuff to them and then it should work somehow. But, but we realized right. that I really think... integrated yeah. and, and they, were, they were coming out to, to get to know their other team members. Yeah. And this is such an important part of agency growth is to have this exchange. You're not just hiring a group of people that's going to be a satellite that's never going to have yeah. any kind of interaction with HQ. Yeah. Yeah, this is really, and I think it's the most important. And that's also something that we lost out of sight a bit at some point where people just thought it's, it's working. And, and I think that's where I played a big role that I said, okay, no, we need to really be there. Also that, that we as, as leading team, but also teammates, we should be there from time to time. So I personally try to be in the office. I mean, now it's a bit difficult, but before um, the pandemics, I have been there like three, four times per year just to work for one, two weeks from the office. And um, I usually also go for holidays because I really like it. But yeah, I think it's nice. really important. And now we have we have this this core team there. And now it's, of course, more easy. And, and now the new people, yeah, they usually come for one, two weeks, but it's not important that they stay two, three months there again, because I think we now have the spirit there and then people are just a part of Kokomor. So yeah, now it's more easy to grow there. And I think this is and really what's really the important. difference in size, like the, the folks that are in, let's say the Frankfurt office um, versus Sevilla in terms of team size is, uh, is Sevilla uh, still relatively small? How many people are there versus in other parts of Germany? I, I think in, in Spain, we are around 20 people, I would say. But it's it's really mostly IT. So so for me and for my team personally, the biggest part is is in Sevilla and is is in Spain. Um, I honestly have no idea how many we are in Frankfurt now. Cologne is also rather big, but yeah, it's it's getting harder now because people are working remotely, and then we now we also have now an office in Poland, and and there are a small office in Berlin, and people working from Hamburg. So it's it's really getting more. Um, more open and more remote. But yeah, I would say 20, 30 people is, is the team in, in Sevilla. Can you can you talk about the challenges of growing an agency like Kokomore has in different countries? What have been maybe main challenges that come to mind or headaches that you had? You know, you, you mentioned insisting that the the teams from different cities are interacting and physically going and meeting and, you know, forming friendships and that there's an exchange. Um, were there other learnings or are there other learnings that you can share with respect to how a digital agency goes global 
And, yeah. and maybe these could be challenges that you remember having to work through. I think you always have to consider cultural differences. Also, they, they even might not be too big. So like, for example, in the Spain, I have the experience that people, or I have the experience, let's put the other way around, that people in Germany often, more often give direct feedback and criticize. And I think a lot of, at least a lot of my Spanish colleagues found it really hard to complain about something because they didn't want to complain and they didn't want to talk bad about people. What's in general, of course, is good, but you also need to, to address if something is not working fine if you want to improve it. So you really had to tell them, hey, it's okay. If this is going wrong, then please um, tell it. So you really need to, to see what the cultural differences are and then try to, to address them and that it, that it works together. Um, what else? I think we also had some issues in general with, with remote work. So um, in IT, we, we had people working fully remotely since, I don't know, three three years before the pandemics, I would say. Um, but it was only us in IT and the other parts of Kokomore were not really used to it. And it was sometimes really hard to make people <laughs> realize, okay, there are people also that um, will not join um, in, in real, but they will join via computers. So please don't leave them out just because they are not in the room. And, you know, all these things, it was really hard to get people used to this. And then also I know how things, work. how things have changed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. So in, in this respect, it get really, really better for us now because everybody's now used to it. And this makes things a lot, a lot easier. Has global delivery become easier? Do you think? post pandemic, because now everyone's really working remote. Have you seen it um, go easier, smoother or harder in terms of getting I work think, done? And, and I, I think it has two sides. And then this is in fact something I, I think will be really challenging for us as an agency this year. So that, of course, everybody's getting used to working remotely. And I think that's great because, yeah, you can find more people easily and people can also find better jobs. And I think that's that's really good. But you also see this in the development of the of the salary expectations so that um, people now realize that they can work everywhere and then they can, of course, um, ask for different salary. And that's, that's totally fine because everybody should get what they deserve. But then on the other hand, you have the clients who still have in mind, I mean, you have these rate cards and then they have in mind okay, you can get cheaper labor from there and there. And maybe it's not like that. And then we're in the agency are somehow in this in this middle position. And, and <laughs> you have the feeling that we are we're squeezed from both sides. And I think this will be really a challenge now um, in, in this year to, to see how this development development will be and to see that we that we um, transfer this that IT work is valuable. And I'm really happy about that because was something I really didn't like that there was this perception that you can get IT work for cheap if you just go to some other countries. Um, but yeah, I think this will definitely be a challenge we, we are having this year. This has been our experience as well at Accelerant with global team members. You know, about, I would say, 85% of our agency is based out of India. We're almost 200 people strong now. And the expectation that well, you have folks who work in India, therefore, we expect the rates to be incredibly reduced. Yeah. And of course, there is there is a difference in um, in the rate card with with global work, but it's not the difference that people expect. Not now, not in yeah. 2022, for sure. Yeah, Things right. have improved. And this and this is a good thing for all of us. Yeah. You know, I, I remember living in Germany. Uh, you were speaking a little bit ago about the cultural differences um, as being so important with a global agency, understanding those nuances. And in Germany, when I when I was able to live there, it was an incredible time uh, for about two years. There is a directness to um, to to German communication and and especially in business. And I'd like I'd like to speak about your career growth at Kokomore because I'm imagining that it was a lot of a lot of feedback from your colleagues and you don't go from being a, a software developer to being a CTO without that kind of feedback and it, it I would imagine that it was uh, it was at times quite quite challenging and rewarding uh, growing at Kokomore from you know being a developer to being yeah. a chief technology officer 
what advice do you have, you know, someone going from, you know, where you were to where you are now, specifically when it comes to things like direct feedback and, and how to grow and how to incorporate what people are saying without it demotivating you? I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. For me, all of this felt rather natural. So I, I was never, I was never really at some point where I said, okay, and now I want to become the CTO and this will be my next steps to be there, right? So everything happened. I mean, it didn't happen accidentally. So <laughs> I did my part for this, but it was never that, that this was my big, big career goal. And I think it, it's, yeah, as I said, it rather happened, happened naturally. But then, what is important, I think, is that you that that you say what you want. So in the end, if you if you are not happy with things, you really need to address them. And I think that's that's the most important. I think that's also one thing that that I'm do, doing good. That I yeah I give permanent feedback, especially also to to my direct boss, right? So when I'm not happy with things and when I want to change things, then I need to talk about it. And this is something that I realized what. What often happens, and is a pity, that that people rather leave the company instead of just saying what they don't like. They they maybe complain with their colleagues, but they never go to their bosses and say, "Hey, look, this and this is going wrong, and we have to change it." I mean, of course, some do, but but some don't. And I think really just talk with people because, yeah, it would be great if we all realized what's going wrong, but everybody's so busy, and and then it's not that easy. So we are really depending on people being open with us, and I think. That's something that, yeah, through all steps I, I did, I think that I really had a good relation with, with people on my team. And then this is still, I mean, if you would ask me, what are you the most proud of? And then it's definitely the people on my team and the good relation we are having. And um, that I really have the feeling that we can trust each other, that really a lot of them are more than, than just colleagues, but really good friends. And I think that's the most important to to keep this um, relation between people. But then also, as you said, you, you also need to be able to provide feedback back also to the people. So if you realize that things are not going wrong, then you need to talk about them because you want them to change. And you you cannot accept that things are going wrong, just you want to be the friend of everybody. So um, um, we at Kokomoro, our CEO gives every new employee the book of, of Radical Candor. I guess you know this from Kim Scott. Yes. Yeah? And I think this really fits fits quite good. So because it's it's important to to be open to people, but then it's of course also important to be empathetic and to to understand people and to really care about people. I remember in that book there's this story in the beginning about someone who was such a nice guy and she was managing this person, right? And and he was such a nice person that they they liked him so much they never gave constructive criticism yeah. in in an actionable way and eventually this person was let go in the story and said nobody told me right yeah. was very frustrated um and yeah this is mandatory reading at, at accelerant as well especially in remote right where speaking to someone yeah. you you have to really over communicate isn't that true in a remote environment, you have to make sure that things are documented and very, very clear because it's just different from being able to pull someone aside in the office and have a little chat. Yeah. You have to be a little bit more direct in our kind of work environment. Would you agree? Yeah, that's also something I, I really try to do that, that I have. I mean, of course, we have our regular one to ones with direct reports, but I really now that we are not able to meet in person, I try that I have really regular meetings. And if it's only just half an hour, this every employee from, I mean, everybody in my team from time to time, because I think it's really important that I just don't talk to people who are directly reporting to me, but I also want to understand what the people um, below are thinking and, and how things are going and to to have a feeling for what might be, be wrong. And because, yeah, I, I think that's that helps a lot if, if you're not working, if you're working remotely, it helps a lot that you meet from time to time at least, because then you get a real feeling for what's going on or what might be wrong. And that's harder now in the pandemics to do this. How would you have done it differently? You mentioned that part of your, part of your career growth at Kokomore has been, you know, taking feedback, incorporating change, but also giving, you put more of an emphasis on giving that feedback, including to your managers 
and that this helped you to grow, how would you have done it differently? Are there things that you would have changed about your career trajectory at Kokomore or maybe, um, maybe there were things that you would have done differently with respects to managing certain situations. And you've learned from that now, but if you could go back and change something, this would be something you would change. Does anything come to mind? Um, One thing is that I probably should have trusted more in myself earlier. So as I said, I, I never said really, okay, I want to be the CTO. And then maybe I should have, at some point I said, I want to do it now. And, and then I, I became this, I got this position and it was fine. Maybe I should have done this earlier. And, and But yeah, it, it takes some time, right? To see if you really think you're capable to do this. Um, something else, I mean, that's more personal, but I think there were also phases where I was really stressed out and then there was a lot of work and, and then I took things too personal and I t- took a lot of stuff home with me. And and this is something that I also realized. I mean, now I'm, I'm working only four days per week. So it's only 80% since, since two years. And it was it was the best decision ever. So I, I know that I'm privileged to do this, right? So of course you must be able to, to afford this. But if you can, I, I can only <laughs> recommend to do this because it gives you so much more um, quality of life outside of work. And then I'm, I'm much more relaxed in work now. So I'm doing this since, since two years. And I, I really realized this, how much it brings myself, how much better I can I can focus and how much more energy I can bring when I'm, when I'm there. So I, I really think that's something I also always tell people where I feel they have the tendency to, to overwork that that I tell them that it's really important to take care about your mental health and, and what you want to bring and that you step need to step back and not just, yeah, overwork for, for months. It's, it's, yeah, it's normal. I mean, if there's a release or whatever, then you have some crazy weeks, but that's fine. But it shouldn't be a permanent status. And I think that's really important. And that's also something I, I had to learn, I think, along the way that to find where are my boundaries and, yeah. I'd like to go back to what you mentioned about there was a time where you decided, I want to do this. I want to be CTO. I want to do this. How did you come to that decision? Um, yeah, in, in fact, I had some experiences with some <laughs> some IT bosses that, that didn't work too well. And um, then we found somebody and... It still it, it didn't work out. What was pity, but but yeah. Um, but then I was somehow in this position where I thought, okay, should there be a new one coming? And then you have the feeling you're always the one who's who's more or less guiding the people and training the people because you are around. You know everything. You, of course, I don't know everything, but <laughs> you know how how things are going and what's what's happening. And then you explain this and train people, and then you don't know if they stay or if they will leave. And and then you never know if you can get along with these people. So there's always this uncertainty if it will be great. Or maybe, as I said, maybe there were some people in the past that weren't that great and where I think it should have done differently. And then I thought at some point, okay, I can do this and I can do this better. So <laughs> I I want to do this because it, it gives me, yeah, then if I have the responsibility, I, I will happily take it. But it's, it's easier than... Uh, sorry, but before I, I've rather been in this position, I did a lot of stuff, but I wasn't really responsible for that. And that was somehow frustrating because you also had the feeling that you couldn't change things and you were always depending on, on somebody in the middle. And um, that could have, that was frustrating in, in some some situations. And that was the point when I said, okay, look, I, I don't want to. I don't want to deal with new people <laughs> anymore whom I have to, to explain our business. I think I can do this myself. And that was it. <laughs> What's your advice to, um, to someone who wants to get to the C-suite? You know, someone who wants to become a chief technology officer, what would you tell them? I would tell them that, yeah, as I said, that you should always be addressing your concerns your ideas and everything and and addressing in both directions right up and down i think it's also important that you build a team around you that that supports you so it's 
it's it's really needed that you have good people who have expertise in, in all areas that are relevant for you. So I'm definitely not the one who knows most about everything. So it's rather that I know um, what the people on my team know and I know with whom to talk and, and whom I can bring. And so for me, this is something really important to have a team that, that also helps you to get in this position. What do you think makes a good leader? I, I think a good leader should have empathy and um, really care about the people. So that's, that's, that's really, for me, the, this is the most important, to really care about people, um, to be interested in the people, to ensure that the people have the possibility to do their best work and that um, the circumstances are in a way that they can deliver good work, that they are happy at work. And um, yeah, and, and there are things are coming in like like giving feedback, but like also like trying to to um, to ensure that they have a working environment where they can really focus and where they can do what they are there for. And like one example, and that's also something what what I liked at Kokomor um, that that you can actually do things. So. In the past, it's really many years ago, we weren't so happy with our project management there because we had some project managers and it was the situation. They were always like, oh, that's technology. I don't, I don't understand this. I don't want to talk about this. So just do your job, right? And that really led to the developers always being completely stressed out because the people were just pressing and they, they didn't understand why such a small change on a website might take three days or this, this classical question, how long will it take? Yeah, as long as I find the bug, right? I, I cannot tell you in the end. And then people were, were really hard, uh, were really not able to, to get in this understanding. So at some point, I mean, there were a lot of meetings and discussions and what can we improve and what can we change. But at some point, I just said, okay, I want to hire IT project managers because I really don't want my team to be stressed out with <laughs> these project managers anymore and then we said okay let's hire some IT project managers and it worked out perfectly so we had the IT project managers and it was really good and then sooner or later they took also over other projects that were not IT so now the whole project management team is, is located in the IT and and this is something to really and I really think the developers are also much happier now because now they are dealing with people that that understand them and they have understanding about the technology about what we're actually building and i think these things are really important to to try to find ways um to yeah to help people do their best work and and to grow the kind of feedback that you had to take from the technologists when they're coming to you and they're saying, this person doesn't understand our work, we don't feel understood. At Kokomore, is it something that is a system? Do you have a feedback system that allows you to do this, to connect with people and take in their challenges? Or is it done in a different way? Um, I mean, we have this regular one, one-to-ones per, per week, right, where every every team lead managers talking with their direct reports and these should be used for for giving feedback um we also have the the yearly yearly talks i don't know and then we are doing some 360s there where people can give feedback um we also have in a bigger bigger round we have some kind of oh, i don't remember Ah, we have to ask me anything with, with our CEO where they're always like drawing some people that are then just put together where they can ask everything. So we really try to be to be open for feedback and to gather feedback from, from all areas. But I really think that people should, I mean, of course, also in the projects we are doing retrospectives so people can also bring criticism if they have any. Um, but yeah, I, I think in general, we are really really open and we we have this flat hierarchy so so people shouldn't worry and i hope that they don't <laughs> to to openly just talk when they have the feeling that something is going wrong i'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about your life outside of work hobbies or interests do you still paint or do creative things when you are on your fridays off you mentioned only four days a week right so on your your day off are you are you taking up any hobbies, painting or anything like this, art projects? Yeah. In fact, Wednesday is my day off. So I, I really like it 
to have two days, two days. I think that's that's nice. Um, yeah, I, I still like to do creative things mostly. So I, I really do all all things you can do. I also like to sew. I like to do cross stitch. I like to to knit. I like to to paint. Or um, so everything that's coming in my hands is, is something <laughs> that that I really like because I. I think it's good to mix it to um to to keep your mind busy but not too busy. That that's something I really like. If I and lately I really discovered here's a small shop where you can draw tiles or porcelain or ceramics and I really really like that because yeah, you you need to be focused but it's not exhausting. It's rather like getting into the flow and then keeps you distracted and that's something I I really like. I have to ask you this. How do you take Wednesdays off? It's right in the middle of the week. <laughs> I mean, that was it. Is it really was it really difficult in the beginning to do this? Because it seems like Wednesdays, right when everything's really moving, <laughs> that's when you're out of <laughs> office. Yeah, no, but I, I don't know. I mean, the the idea behind it was that. I actually like Fridays in the office because everybody is in a good mood and everybody is already, you know, everybody has this weekend spirit. And I always think it's sad to have Fridays off because then you're missing this day. And then could have been Mondays, but then I think that's really hard because every t everything is coming back. And if you mit miss this day coming on Tuesdays, I could imagine it's really hard. But so, I mean, yeah, there are, times where I work, right? But then that's also, I think, an advantage because you have this this buffer in the middle. So when things are really getting crazy, you always know, okay, this Wednesday is not planned for anything. There are no meetings. So if I need to do something, I can really do it in peace because I'm not right. caught in this things that are regularly happening. So yeah, it, and it usually works, works quite fine. <laughs> I can only recommend what? Wednesdays off. What are you most proud of? in your in your career um in fact i i feel feel a bit silly because i always talk about the team but in fact that's that's really um what i'm what i'm most most proud of that i have this team or we are this team and i really think we are a good team and i really think that i also think that people value my my work and see my value and see my importance in this whole team and in this whole construct um, and I'm really proud of that. Also, when I see how much the Spanish team has grown, when I remember when the two two first guys arrived here ten years ago, and and then if you if I see pictures from the team events, and we are having the twenty people are there, and then everybody's having so much fun, and then even if people have left Cocomore, we are still meeting afterwards. So this is something I'm I'm really proud of that. I have the feeling that. I made a difference for for the IT team there and that I, I brought the IT team to the better. Well, what about the future? What would you like to do going forward? You have, a, yeah. I mean, a, a, so, so many opportunities ahead of you, right? What do you want to do <laughs> next? I, I think so, especially for this year, I think we will definitely grow and I think that will be a big a big challenge to to ensure this growth but in a sustainable way so that we don't just throw more people in projects and then um <laughs> hope that it somehow magically um works but that we really need to to define ways I mean we've still got some ways for like to onboard people but I think there's also enough room for improvement to really ensure if we want to grow and also grow fast how we can can make this happen without burning people and and without risking anything and i think this is really a big challenge and that's one of my biggest goals for this year is to to ensure this growth to to see um yeah where this team can grow if we find other locations which with, with which we can work to to ensure more growth and yeah i guess this will be exciting this year <laughs> What, you seem like you're such a people person, so focused on, on people. Why are people so important to you? Why is the team so important to you? Because as a technologist, isn't it true that people are often more interested in things than they are people? And you seem to be the opposite, in a sense. Yeah, maybe... 
I mean, maybe that's something I was thinking about this generally, why why I also feel so tied to Kokomoro and then why I stayed there for so long. And I think that has also a bit to do with my apprenticeship because, as I said, I mean, this, these three years when I did this media design stuff, it wasn't really nice because there it was really like a traditional hierarchical company so you really when the big boss was coming everybody was afraid and people yelled at each other so when you did something bad you got yelled at and they, you were really told oh, how stupid can you be you know all these things it, it was really not nice oh um, i mean it was many years ago so hopefully that has changed <laughs> in some way but but for me this was really these three years were really hard and i was really like thinking okay how will you ever survive going to work when work life is like this because i thought okay if you go to work this is how going to work feels like and then there was I was really deeply worried how I can cope with this. And then arriving at Kokomo, where everybody was, was really nice and, and open, and this open feedback culture was really pushed forward. And, and that was like a game changer for me that you realized, okay, because then in the apprenticeship, it was like I hated when it was Sunday evening, you had to so think about Monday. I really hated it a lot. And then suddenly you realized, hey, you can go to work and it's actually fine. So you, you sometimes really, really like going there because you meet people. And and that was, yeah, that was really like the game changer for me. And maybe that's also why I put this importance there. But then I think also people make the difference. So you, you, you can do some coding or managing or everywhere. But that's just for me it's important that you have the right people around you and and that's what what makes it fun and i think that's also what makes you successful in the end so it, it's not just about fun and it's not like yeah we're a happy family and we all like each other we do but of course it's also important that you that you get the right outcome and then that you deliver in the end um but i think you do this with more fun if you if you like the people around you <laughs> is there someone that you consider a mentor at work or in life, someone that you look up to or has helped has really helped you to grow. Yeah, I, I think there are there are different people um, at at work. So I said one of my my first um, IT bosses who who put me in this position that was like I think back then we called it software manager or something like that. So it was already being a bit, not just the developer, but getting out there. And I think he was really helpful for me. Also, I mean, he was the one who decided that we used Trooper back then. And then I remember also when it was about conferences and events, and I really, I didn't want to go there in the beginning because I was really intimidated. You know, you have all these developers and, oh, I don't know, maybe I'm not good enough. And he was, he was not pushing, but he was just really convincing me in, in nice ways that I should try it. And... And yeah, and then I remember then the first first Drupal event I, I went with him and one two more colleagues it was DrupalCon London in I don't know it was quite some some years ago. <laughs> yeah, and it was so crazy because I felt so welcomed and it was so nice and it was such a good event and it was. Yeah, and then that was my entry point in the Trooper community. And when you think back, how many nice people you met with with all the Trooper events that that you go and this was also that was changing so much. And I'm, I'm really thankful that that he was there back then, and and he put me also in this direction to be a bit more open and to trust more myself. So I think that was really important. And then um, with with some other former from a boss who wasn't really an IT boss. He just took over responsibility for the IT. Um, and, and he also helped me a lot to, to grow, just to see his way of working. Also, some things that I think sometimes getting forgotten that you really should care about details. So it doesn't help if you do just something really, really hasty, but just to get it done. But that it's important that before you send something out, read everything, even if you're bored, because you have already read 10,000 times, but still check if everything is there, if everything is correct. And this can be super annoying when it's late in the evening and you just want to go home. But it's it's really something that um, not only from him, but also from our CEO, these are things that you learn. And sometimes yeah, it gets on your nerves, but I think it's really something that's that's important to, to do this. And that... Also, I had trust in, in these people. That That's also, I think, one of the most important things. So even if, if you argue and if you're not happy, um, 
I always feel that I, I can trust them and that nothing was done bad on purpose or so, so that you could always believe that, that things are done for best intentions and even if things are maybe not going as you expected, that, yeah, it wasn't meant on purpose to, to do you something bad. Have you ever done a podcast like this before? No. <laughs> Well, I have a secret that I didn't tell you in the beginning. <laughs> Neither have you neither. I. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so. oh, but I think we did well. <laughs> I think so. I guess a, a few last things. Um, let's see. Uh, when when the world is back to normal, when the world is back to normal, whatever that means, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> do you, is Sevilla on your list? Do you want to go directly to Sevilla? Is there any any other place that you really want to to go to or something that you really want to do when things open back up. Yeah. In fact, it's, it's severe. So, I mean, luckily we've been there last autumn and then still it was the time before. Yeah. I've been there pre pandemics and then we've been there last September, I think. And it was it's really when we when we flew and then we reached Sevilla, I started to cry in the plane because I really miss it so much and so deep from my heart. And I was so happy to be back. And yeah, again, that that will be the the next goal, definitely to to be there, not only for work but also. I mean, my husband also loves it and and likes the people a lot. So we're usually going for holidays there. I'm not, I, I hate flying, so I'm not going really far destinations. <laughs> so, and Sevilla, not only Sevilla, it's, it's whole Andalusia. So, so everything around there, there are so many great cities and places and beaches. And yeah, that's, that's perfect. And I also really miss people to meet people and, and to really meet, right? To go inside, to go in a bar and to have some drinks and to just party and without being afraid and keeping distance and everything. So I really miss this, this a lot. Yeah, and, and if we can't get this come next August, it's going to be terrible. So I, I'm looking forward to when I'm there, you and I will have to go out for some paella or something. You'll have to show me around because it'll be a yeah, new definitely city for me and my family as well. <laughs> so looking forward to it. Yeah. Um, my last question, if you, if, if you don't mind, do you have any favorite books or authors or podcasts or thought leader recommendations Maybe these are things that had a really big impact on you, books or or, or podcasts. Yeah. I, I was thinking about that, but to be honest, I'm I'm not too much into the <laughs> these things. So I mean, yeah, sometimes you, you stumble across some books like we had with Radical Candor. Then of course, if you if you have these um, these sessions from conferences like the Drupalcom or the Lead Dev Conference in London, I think there you always find some some valuable sessions that that give you some insights. But it's rather that yeah, I, I follow some recommendations. But I also must admit that I'm somebody who who really likes to disconnect. So when I'm, for example, on holidays, I usually don't don't spend time or too much time with work related podcasts. But I'm really happy when I can just listen to some audiobooks or whatever that are not related to work at all. So Ella, where can we find you online? Is LinkedIn the best place to connect with you or are there maybe you have a website or what's the best way to get in contact with you? Uh, yeah, I think the best way is, is definitely LinkedIn. I'm on Twitter, but to be honest, my, my Twitter handle is, yeah, no, <laughs> it's Kamikaze Hertz, but this was a four. So I guess it's a bit hard to, to find this, but LinkedIn is the best place. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for making time to speak with me today. This was really, really great. I, I'm, I'm so happy. Thanks a lot for having me. It was, it was really fun. 